All right, welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I want to introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. Um, my name is Michelle DeWitt and I am the Senior Citizens Coordinator for Lifelong Montclair. That's where you are today. This is my logo behind me. This is a healthy, um, healthy aging initiative uh, supported by both the Township of Montclair and the Partners for Health. We are um, a partly grant funded program and we're really happy to have you here today. Uh, so since it's inception, our programs have provided both health and wellness education and classes, um, as well as many opportunities, learning opportunities in the arts uh, and culture segment. So in addition to this, uh, before the pandemic, we would meet at the Edgemont Park House, which is where I'm right now. And for many years, this center was the hub of activities for seniors in the area. People would come here and they'd meet, they formed friendships and formed clubs. So when the pandemic hit, um, our senior center was shut down obviously, and we, but we quickly pivoted to an all online format, which as you can imagine was an enormous task. Not only did we have to learn these Zooming skills, but then we had to teach them to our staff. Many of our staff are volunteers. Some of them are retirees, um, older adults. And then we had to, go ahead and um, teach our, our clients how to use this technology. So it's a huge task. Um, it wasn't easy, but we did manage to get a large majority of our seniors Zooming. And it, just to give you an idea of how many people are doing this, in the last three months of 2020, we had over 8,000 uh, participations in our various classes. And to put that in perspective, we would normally have in a year um, 7,000 total participations in all of our classes put together. And so we had 8,000 in three months. So it's a huge increase. And one of these classes, these online classes that we um, were providing uh, was this poetry workshop led by a volunteer. Um, she's a university um, nursing professor and she's also a published poet. And she does other things for us. Um, her name is Leah Robotham. Uh, Leah has met with these novice, mostly novice poets, some more experienced than others, but we, we sort of meet in eight week cycles. And um, after one cycle, Leah managed to put together a book of poetry um, and, and publish it in a nice booklet. Um, and then after the second cycle of classes, um, as the pandemic was raging on, uh, Leah decided to have the poets focus on um, their thoughts and feelings about the pandemic specifically. And the, the group took on a different, sort of a slightly different form. Uh, and it sort of became a therapy, a very therapeutic for the group. Uh, this exercise yielded, once again, an incredible body of work recently published. Leah published this in the second anthology entitled appropriately Pandemology. So this is the uh, this is the published version of the poems you're about to hear today. So, so I just want to say through our poetry, and I need to stop right here and let you know that while I still have a few years left to go before I am a, considered a senior, um, I was so intrigued by the work of this group that they allowed me to participate. Um, and in fact, they encouraged me to participate, even though sometimes I'm doing a lot of other things. Uh, it's just so it was just such a delight and um, I'm so thankful that I've been able to really be a part of this, this process. And I think the most important thing is what's so interesting about these poems in particular is that they reveal this, this, uh, they, they reveal our feelings about the pandemic, but more than that is, is this resulting deeper understanding of ourselves, of many of our pasts and our present our fears, and then ultimately our resilience. And that's why we've been asked to be a part of this Bounce Festival. Uh, this Bounce is a, a initiative by uh, Tony's Kitchen and it was started a couple of years ago to show um, the resilience in a community, right? We've had tragedies and things happen, but this community of Montclair comes together and we bounce back. So this is just another example of bouncing back and, um, really showing our community together. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really, really pleased to introduce to you our 
our, our teacher, our leader, um, our, our, the, the one that really made, made all of this happen. Um, so let me introduce Leah and get her spotlighted here. Thanks, Leah. And I, I can't tell you how honored I am to have gotten to work with the people that I get to work with here. Um, thanks to Michelle and to Katie, um, not only their generosity, but the fact that with their, their gifted and creative talent, they have been able to pull all of this together. Um, they allowed me to reach out to our seniors and say, come right with me. Well, let me tell you, I, I cannot tell you how shocked I was and how pleased I was at the talent, the amazing talent that I found. And that was the reason why I wanted to put out our first anthology. And the work was amazing. Um, little did I know that last March, we would start using Zoom. I, I had only been using it for a couple of weeks, you know, to teach. And I, it was all new to me. I just turned 75. And sometimes I think I'm dangerously close to old. You know, I mean, that happens. But I'm, I'm not technically skilled at all. Um, I have poor vision, so that doesn't help. But I love writing. And writing has always been a wonderful, wonderful outlet for me. And I wanted to share that. So even though you will find that some of the work in um, pandemology doesn't actually even use that word. We don't even use the word pandemic. We don't always use the word um, virus, but we talk about some of the loneliness, some of the hope that was needed to get through it. Um, the fact that even being older, that the pandemic in some ways, even through isolated days, even through lonely days, in some ways, it's been easier for older people because we've already used coping skills to get through other things. People have gone through wars, people have gone through depressions, people have gone through Vietnam. Um, people have had to use coping skills. So hopefully a lot of those skills we have been able to hand down to the next generations. And some of that I think you'll hear today. Some of that you'll hear how people looked back at their own paths and went through that. So um, with my group of fellow poets that I hope now to work with forever, um, I'd like to start. Um, our first reading, um, believe it or not, I'm doing for one of our very gifted poets. Um, she's in Florida. She could not be with us today. She was um, kind of afraid that maybe, um, you know, all the technical stuff, et cetera, it wouldn't come through and she didn't want to um, mess that up. Her name is Gladys Carbuccia. So I don't feel that I'm going to do all the justice that her poem deserves, but I'm certainly going to give it my best shot and try. So here we go. The name of her poem is Faith and a Preacher. My two sisters and I walked to church. Our new dress is sewn from a simplicity pattern, selected from the oversized catalog at Woolworths. The puckered hems finished in haste, ironed with care on the gray covered board, shiny with use. White vinyl purses adorn the crooks of our elbows. We smile at each other, anticipating the gushy admiration of the other girls who cannot sew. She walks in front of us, our mother, her shiny black handbag in the crook of her own arm, small black hat with tulle covering her forehead, the sun on her face. Our grandparents walk in front of our mother, the figureheads leading the way through the Brooklyn streets to the Pentecostal church where we will praise our Lord and Savior. Our pastor stands at the wide open doors to welcome his flock. People rush by me, intent on finding the best seats. Suddenly I'm alone, standing in front of the pastor, my family already inside. He frowns at me. He points at my shoes, white, with white socks, peeping through the open toes. You cannot wear those shoes in the Lord's house, he says. They're not modest. Go home 
and change. He turns away to welcome others into his church. My heart lurches, my cheeks burn, tears sting my eyes. I stand there frozen. Oh God, what does this mean? What do I do? I can't walk home alone. Where's my mother? But what is this? Two older girls wearing shoes with open toes, with nylon stockings, forbidden by her own mother, though I am 11 and my sister 13, they enter unstocked, unseen. Unfrozen now, I clench my fists, I stamp my foot. This, this ugly red-faced man, how dare he? How dare he stop me, a child of God, from entering this church? I glance at him. His back is to me. He still welcomes others in. He's forgotten me. My shoulders straight, I slip right by him, and I dart inside to find my mother. I glean against her, comforted by her singing voice, her plump arms upheld in prayer. Angry still, I just sit silent. In the church basement for cookies and lemonade, my sisters sit with other girls. I sit by my mother, hurt and confused, angry and defiant. My new dress is forgotten. Five years later, at age 16, I stopped going to church. My grandfather slaps me. My grandmother lectures me. My mother prays. I remain unmoved. And I remember him well, that man who called himself a preacher chosen by God to lead that church. We came every Sunday, mothers, sisters, brothers, grandparents, and aunts, twice during the week. Our dollar bills and quarters placed in the golden plate lined in red velvet. That Sunday, that man, the Holy Bible clutched in his upraised hand, declared that a wife must not separate from her husband. My mother's name spewed loudly from his mouth like a curse for all assembled to hear. This woman, that man declared, can no longer be a member of this church. She sat there mute, her face like a scraped tablet. She who had newly left our father, his abuse no longer able to be born. The assembly silent after these words, no voices raised in outrage for her. No indignation expressed. I was outraged for you, mother. Who was this man to render judgment against you? A devoted servant of God? That other man, my father, you were right to leave him. But there you were, mother, scorned and shamed once more by your own preacher. Why were you silent, mother? No protest against this fresh affront? Was this not too much to bear? Was this not enough to incite your anger? To cause you to cry out? I was outraged for my mother then, but a child was not allowed to speak out for her. I grieve for her now when I think of this. But time has made me see her silence revealed her strength. Her faith was unassailable. God was kind, merciful, true. No need to argue or debate. No reason to respond to godless words. A new church she found. A kinder, happier place to pray. Her faith never wavered, though mine was lost. The courage and strength that was hers, I now find in me. Thank you.
Thank you, Leah. Uh, that was very well done, very moving. Um, my name is Mark Schoenfield. I'm a new member to the group. Leah has uh, welcomed me and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I'm always amazed at the diversity and style and content of the different types of storytelling in this poetic uh, avenue. My poem is called, It's an Old Story. It's an old story. Perhaps you know it. Years ago, my wife and I bought an accent chair for the living room, a wingback chair of moderate cost with blue and white stripes. She believed it should be positioned near our wooden cocktail table. I believed it should be placed further back near an alcove. We argued for years about the proper placement of the chair. The reasons don't really matter. What was aesthetically pleasing to my wife was quite irritating to me. Each and every time I entered the room, an inward sigh up by one, the tally of my nonverbal annoyance. And yet years later, after my wife had passed away, I could not bring myself to reposition the chair. The desire to subtract the irritation was no longer present. Was it guilt, contrition, homage? How fickle and childish and deep love is. I told you, it's an old story. Um, the next reader will be Michelle DeWitt. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, we really love um, having, having you in this group and your perspective and your sensitivity. Um, we really appreciate it. So my poem is called Timestamp. It would be a lie to say that it came without warning I am always paying attention to signs from death threats that come in all shapes and sizes. I've been on high alert since the beginning of my existence, being ripped from the safety of the warm brown place and left to defend myself in the cold white of daylight and stabbing silence of space, floating on my back, endless summers alone, staring at the sky watching the familiar flight patterns of jets and checking my waterproof watch, a timestamp, ready to recall for reporters the exact time I saw the rogue plane overhead before it crashed. I spent my whole life looking up, looking out for impending catastrophe and simple trip hazards, preparing and waiting. And when it came the first time, making history with brilliant, horrific explosions and bodies tumbling like rag dolls out of bedroom windows. I would not be trapped or caught off guard. I moved steadily through the streets. You should know I did not check my watch. No reporters came to me after the dust was cleared, though we did throw a party when life returned to not normal. I didn't stop buzzing for 19 years. My wires were tripped, stuck in an on position. And then last winter, I thought our doom would come again from a madman. A gift was promised for Christmas. So I stocked up on canned goods, Vienna sausage and shelf stable milk because I am the caretaker, the protector, the overcompetent but instead the gift came from somewhere else, silently hidden in the breath of a song or a warm handshake. And for a long time, we couldn't identify the real enemy. Though the ignorant blamed my son and made him loathe himself while my heart broke and the fear washed over me, once again, I am floating, staring at the sky finally coming full circle, knowing that I will be reborn this time without those sensors, without a timestamp.
Thank you, Michelle. That was very moving. Thank you, Michelle. That was very moving. My name is Rita Cohen, and the title of my poem is My COVID Vegetable Garden. I planted a vegetable garden and watched it grow with small green seedlings sprouting. Talking to them soothed my soul as new life marked time passing. Surrounded by sickness and death, as the pandemic ramped up and went viral, a need to connect with nature and take a breath, hoping by harvest life would be back to normal. Week by week, I tracked my plant's height and counted their number of leaves. When blossoms formed, what an amazing sight, waiting for the pollination by the bees. Fruits soon emerged as summer peaked, as they ripened on the vine. A courageous squirrel, a tomato sneaked, and some deer thought the leaves were divine. Cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, and butternut squash, and herbs of rosemary and thyme, nurtured, nourished, and showered with a daily wash, soaking up the sun, bearing fruit so sublime. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. I love that poem. It makes me know that there's still hope. Um, my next poem is back to it. I love tennis. I always have. I was never great at it, but I still loved it. I'm left-handed. My backhand never worked well. Always just switched racket to the right hand. Now that took a little more time than needed for a pro. So even to make the tennis team, it was a 400 person high school. We didn't even have a court, but I stuck to it. Even when I moved to the top of the mountain for a while, I drove down twice a week for lessons in a small town that actually had a racket club, four courts, one pro, and they even named it the Chester Racket Club. Who had never even played with a lefty was their pro. You don't think he knew what to do with me in a lesson, do you? But I was faithful. I kept coming for lessons. And the fun of it all outshone my humiliation. Now, I had to stop when there were a few high-risk pregnancies, and I didn't go back for a while until we moved again, and we moved to a town that had a lot of tennis courts, and I went in the early morning of sun rising to outside courts with my six-year-old son, Robert. I smashed that ball back and forth for at least an hour running after it more than making actual racket to ball contact. But there was contact. Leah, you're, mu you're muted, Leah. I don't know how that happened. Now I'm 75. And a few weeks ago, Amazon delivered a brand new tennis racket that I had ordered in early February as a birthday present for myself. And by the time I got it, it was November and it was pretty cold outside. But this, the desire was still there. It tingled in my left hand. I felt the grip of the handle swirling around my wrist. I wanted to see if I could still lift it over my left shoulder far enough and with enough power for a decent serve. I wasn't real sure, but I was optimistic. Now I tripped on the curb on my way across the street to get all of this done. 
but I was quite convinced that in spite of some recent loss of balance and vision, that they would not be a detriment to my process. After all, don't you know, I have muscle memory and I have picked myself the perfect partner to get back at it again. Now this partner is quite tall. He's neither kind nor gentle, but truly the most consistent and non-judgmental coach pro teacher that I have ever had. Whatever I give him, he hands back to me in spades, maybe with no bounce, maybe in a direction I never thought my serve would give him. Maybe it would not allow me to get it back over a net, never mind inside the line, and where I would never be able to get it back to him. And you know, he never got tired. He never stopped for a water break or to towel off his sweat and his brow and his racket. He never questioned a line call. His temperament was as even as it was 66 years ago when I spent hour after hour with a second or maybe it was a third or fourth hand racket and balls that usually had less than the required bounce. But it didn't matter then and it doesn't matter now. He's still there for me in the early part of sunrising mornings in a noble tan brick holding up my old high school for me to use for me to triumph, switching my racket from left to right in slower than pro-like style. He is there for me to remind me, don't you know, that there are still walls to bounce balls against throughout the overwhelming, mood-challenging, unwelcome loneliness of pandemic in the early part of sunrising mornings. Thank you, Leah, that was an amazing poem. My name is Bill Corson and my poem is called Hope. Hope is a hard thing to hold on to when hopelessness is a virtue, when the cynic has the edge, and hope is just a thing for fools. But I've seen a golden ribbon cutting across the sky at dawn and know that in the depths of night, somewhere on earth there is, <clears throat> pardon me, somewhere on earth there is light. Our midnight is another's dawn, with the sun burning bright in another sky, nothing is ever that dark. When death and loss embrace us, there's somewhere a child being born. Even in the final moments of life, we're left with the choice of knowing that. In a dark time, we're called to dance and to sing in a time ruled by fear and to make way for tomorrow. And I've seen a golden ribbon cutting across the sky at dawn, and I cannot help but live with hope. Thank you. That was wonderful, Bill. Thank you for the words of hope. My name is Rose Morba, and my poem is Life During the Pandemic. Going to the store to buy last minute desserts or seasonal vegetables came to a screeching halt in March. Buying toilet paper, paper towels, or disinfectant wipes became a research project that took hours. Put on a mask, wear gloves, wash your hands. Who knew shopping would be so stressful? Facebook posts no longer consisted of exciting vacations or the latest political drama. Now I scoured the internet for which big box store had a supply of paper goods in stock. We tried to make sense of our new existence, wear a mask, what's the best kind, stand six feet apart, inside or out, don't touch surfaces, it's okay to touch surfaces. When will all this end? 
we became remarkably resilient, sharing tips and strategies to help us cope. Keep up your immune system, they said. Walk outdoors, meditate, exercise, connect with family, and call long forgotten friends. Virtual chats filled our days, and soon Zooming became the rage. There were so many online classes to take. I wanted to take them all. Poetry writing, film discussions, crafts, and lectures were there to engage. Reluctantly, I accepted the new normal, but longed for when I could hug again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. That was really, really um, heart wrenching and also heartwarming. My name is Sharon Allen and my poem is My Wish For You. And I'd like to dedicate it to my poetry family. The prophet Muhammad once said, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. So what do I wish for you, my friends? I wish you the courage to defend your beliefs and the strength to face the consequences. I wish you doses of healing laughter, a soothing salve that will restore your soul. And I wish you fitting words to fill your verses and fulfilling verses to complete your sonnets. I wish for you the virtue of patience and an empathetic and compassionate heart. And I wish for you, dear friends, the strengthening of your spirit to do whatever you promise. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you, Sharon, uh, for all the wishes. Um, I really like following you. It was it was uplifting. Uh, this is uh, my first poem in the poetry workshop, um, a real newbie. Uh, my poem is titled um, Adagio. I want to learn to play the piano. What an instrument. But I'm unsure if I'm too old to learn those scales, the chords, or perhaps my brain cells will fight me all the way. Still, I wish I could. Maybe I can. I want my fingers to glide, to slide, to tickle those keys. I really would love to. I could get going slowly, so very slowly. It's not as if I want to entertain people. I just want to do it for me. I know I could have a sense of accomplishment, of achievement, and a sense of starting anew. This could be a way of seeing light after a dark pandemic, a kind of uplifting skill to acquire. I think I will start, but slowly, very, very slowly. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for that beautiful poem about new beginnings or hopeful new beginnings. My name is Leonora Brooks and my poem is an ode to trees entitled The Sexiest Thing on My Street. The sexiest thing on my street is a tree. She sways like a vixen sachets down the street. Despite indignation of sawed limbs and pee, she stands erect with proud dignity. I should look to her for my beauty standards instead of today's cosmetic biohazards, hair straighteners, skin lighteners, toxic polish and dyes, implying I'm ugly, to which I've complied. She's contoured with pearls, but she loves those pearls. She knows she's distinct and her splendor unfurls. Each season, I notice how different she looks. Sands, fruit, leaves, or flowers, she still got me hooked. She knows her good looks emanate from within and that not much else is defined by her skin. It's designed for protection and to keep moisture in. And I leave it at that. 
exuding a grin. But more than her value aesthetically is her sense of composure, how she lets herself be. Ornamental and shade tree, her gifts know no bounds. She's a sovereign being rooted deep in the ground. Withstanding storms and calamities by man, as sentinel she guards our sacred land. Silently poised, such that few humans see how linked we are with her destiny. Thank you, Leonora, for your thoughtful, fun, and wonderful poem, as always. I'm Marie Claire, and the title of my poem is, I Was Thinking. I do too much of it, thinking. I don't even try. It happens automatically and all the time. When I'm walking, when I'm meditating, when I'm knitting, or crocheting, or even just doing the dishes. Like an uninvited guest, the thoughts pop up unexpectedly and interrupt and intrude, often taking me back to another time and place or traveling into the future. Sometimes it's unfinished business. Often it's something to worry about. So thrilled that I have finally learned all I have to do to close that cerebral door is to banish these trespassers outside, leaving me enclosed, calm and peaceful to my core. Thank you for sharing your thought provoking poem with us, Marie Claire. Hello, my name is Jackie Dorr. As a hospital volunteer, I received COVID immunization early on, January 8th to be exact. It was a little frightening to be a pioneer and to get the vaccine before so many of my contemporaries. Here are my thoughts on getting the COVID vaccine. I didn't sleep at all last night. Every thought was a fright. I'm scheduled to get the shot today. My crazy thoughts get in the way. What if it doesn't work like they say? Perhaps I'll be sick by the end of the day. It gives me much anxiety. Will I get some immunity? At first I felt honored and so special to me among the first they tell Go get the shot because your help at the hospital, your caring is felt. They told me to sign up. This is really a stroke of luck. Now I don't have to stand in line wasting all that precious time. At the time that I arrive, it's only a short drive. I'm nervous and shaking with fear. How will I do this? The time is near. I walk into the room with the feeling of dreaded gloom, but I'm greeted with an elbow bump and smiling eyes to get me over the hump. I'm in the computer, she tells me, all's in order as far as she can see. Read the questions on the paper, then sign your name right under that data. Now pick a chair and sit down. The nurse is ready, please don't frown. I roll up my sleeve and take a breath. I'm truly scared to death. I close my eyes and feel a jab. In comes that fluid from the lab. Warmth flows into my arm, causing me some alarm. I have to think it will keep me strong. It's been days, it's been so long since our world was shut down tight and it happened just overnight. Then my arm begins to smart. I feel it in my very heart. 
I'm doing the right thing. This is the start to regain everything. They check me out and I am fine. I get to go home until next time. In three weeks, I come back for the second shot to close the gap. I feel so strange, I feel a change. My thoughts go in a big wide range. High and low, my anxiety reaches. Please don't let me fall to pieces. Okay, so now it's done and there's no place to run. I've come to terms with it. I could relax for a little bit. When we look back upon this time, I'm sure we'll come out just fine. Everyone needs to do their best to save the world from more distress. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joyce Goldman. And as Sharon said, I'm part of the poetry family. Jackie, thank you so much for your poem, which I'm sure expresses the feelings of many, 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 if not most of the people as we entered this uh, new world. My poem is called, Oh My Jewels. What, the other day I chanced to glance into my jewelry drawer. It glittered so I had to smile but I don't wear them anymore. So many pins and earrings too, and bracelets, chains and such. I donned them every day in life, but for months now, not so much. I miss the dangling on my neck. I miss the pearls so warm and bright. The many watches in the drawer now hidden out of sight. No parties on my calendar. No meetings and no dates. Is going glitter free, my friend, my plain and simple fate? Oh no, I thought, I felt so sad with no adornments around my neck. This is not right, the jewels cried out. Just wear us, what the heck? So in my sweats, without a bra, I made a solemn vow that even with no place to go, I'd wear them anyhow. And so, when next you see me, be prepared for a surprise, because even my pajamas, I will accessorize. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Joyce. Uh, so that concludes our, uh, our poetry reading. I just want to say um, a couple of things. One is that when all of this started, I, I never could have imagined where we'd wind up. Um, and I think I, I, I've been saying this all along that this opportunity as, as, as horrible as it's been um, has given us this, this opportunity to make um, a lot of lemonade out of all of these lemons that have been um, dealt to us this year. I happen to like lemons, but you know, the metaphor, I just feel like this is one of those really great lemonade moments. So um, with that said, I want to thank all of our poets, my fellow poets, and um, I also want to thank Montclair Bounce for promoting and for supporting our efforts, along with, of course, Lifelong Montclair and the Partners for Health, um, because without them, we wouldn't have this platform. We're going to hopefully um, these poems have inspired you and perhaps um, moved you and maybe made you feel a little less alone. And to all the poets for crafting these, um, these beautiful um, memories and thoughts into incredible words. And of course, uh, to Leah for, for allowing this to happen, for creating this group uh, to begin with and for volunteering her time. Um, Leah, could I just ask you um, to pop back on the screen 
And um, I just want to, I just want people to know um, how a lot of how the workshop works. So that if, if anybody out there is interested in joining us, maybe for the next cycle, um, you could just t t explain our, the process a little bit. Um, I have to say that my, um, the process comes from a woman called Laura Boss, who is my main mentor and has been since probably the early 90s. Um, she's one of the very, very few poets besides Maya Angelou that, um, you know, has actually earned a living teaching poetry, mostly, mostly to children in um, schools and to children that wouldn't have gotten this opportunity otherwise, like in the Patterson School um, District, etc. And she has run a workshop for years in the Monkler Adult School. And then of course, in other, you know, very di different all through, um, you know, the area and in New York City, et cetera. Um, and so how we start the workshop is that we tell everybody you only have to br bring three things and you don't have to bring yourself as a poet. What you have to bring is a sense of adventure. That's really important. Um, a willingness to try it. And I think the most important thing that you have to bring to a poetry class is a love of words, just regular everyday words. And so we talk about that in the beginning that we're not here for spelling, we're not here for grammar. Um, we're very non-judgmental. We're not here to, to um, in any way to criticize. And so we start with something called prompts and most of you know what that is. And we say that um, maybe I'll say seven words or seven phrases in the beginning. And then we take 20 minutes to write. And then we share, if we feel like it, what we wrote. And then everybody has comments or not. Um, we will talk about how we felt about what we write, um, what we might change or not change. And the biggest thing we remember is that what we wrote is our work. So if people make a lot of suggestions, of course, we listen and we might use some of them. But we also know that at the end, it's our voice that did that. And that's an interesting thing that the poets always find out within a couple of weeks. Um, you start to know within a couple of weeks who wrote which poem. You don't need a name on it because everybody writes in a different way, in a different voice. So we always say, yeah, I, I know that's Leonora's voice, or I know that's Michelle's voice, or that's definitely Jackie's voice, or Joyce, or, or Mark's, or, or, or Bill's. We, we know, um, because we all have our own style. So one of the things that happens at, at, after a few weeks of being in this kind of group is that you realize that you have something to contribute that no one else can. And all you need is a little catalyst, a little encouragement. And then I end up with the, the wonderful honor of getting to work with a whole bunch of poets every week. So the, the logistics of it is done by Michelle. I could never go through all of that technically. And, you know, thank God she's pulled people in that probably never used things like Zoom before. And if somebody told me two years ago that I'd be working with a group of, of poets on a computer, I, I wouldn't have known that that was a possibility. I've always done my writing groups in person. So here we are. And it's been a wonderful experience and I'm gonna keep doing it as long as I can. As Thank long you. as I can. Thanks Thank for you, sure. Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we had a really nice crowd of people today and thank you for supporting our poets. And Leah, again, thank you for helping all of us find our voices. It's really um, such a, a privilege and a pleasure to work with you. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for sharing and being so brave. And um, it's just, it's, it's a great thing. Thanks, everybody.